just can't you just can't resist. You just can't turn this down. How about this ad? It says, now in just one hour, you can learn the secret of controlling totally the way people behave. Learn how you can use behavioral psychology to gain absolute power uh, over people. Oh, that's what you need, isn't it, friends? Absolute power over people. And the ad goes on to say, it says, that, yes, dear friend, haven't you often wished you could get people to do what you ask them with just a quiet word? A simple gesture, and it would behave you, but it would absolutely obey you without question. Just a gesture. <laughs> Haven't you wished you could somehow turn on the power of your immense personality to assert total control over the others? Well, uh, for those of you who have had any mistaken ideas about what man's true nature is, I suggest you read some of the ads that are appearing these days give you an insight into Adolf Hitler and a few other guys. Total control. Charlie Manson. Just a flick of the wrist. Will somebody please call up WINS? They've got all these commercials on about the book about Charles Manson. Will you please call up Stan Z. Burns and tell him it is not slavish followers of Charles Manson? Slavish? I guess he thinks they're a bunch of Russians or something. You know, the Slavs. It's slavish. Slavish. Right? <laughs> Yeah, so, so let's. I want to. I want to demonstrate my power to get you to do absolutely my bidding. Call up WINS and tell them it is a slavish follower of. I said a slavish follower of Charles Manson, and that you yourself are a slob and you don't like that implication. Uh, <laughs> I got that power. Watch me. I'll do that again now. Just to. I got, you want to hear how I can get a crowd to cheer? Watch. Just a wave of the hand. Watch, watch now. Just, just, uh, oh no, 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 no. I've got to feel it inside of me. It's got to come from within me. I cannot, uh, let the crowd operate on its own because you know how the crowd can get. Get out of hand, bust windows, walk around, smoke cigars. All right, watch this. Wave of the hand. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's all right. Hey! Okay. Now we got him going. In case you're wondering where that chair came from, you know that chair was actually recorded? Did you know, Barney, where that chair's from? That chair was recorded at the last Carnegie Hall show that I did. <laughs> so it's authentic, you know. Oh, God, nothing like the authentic. Hey, you know, speaking of authentic, you know one thing about Americans that has been noted among other uh, people in the world is we have very little sense of history. Uh, we have a sense of nostalgia, but no sense of history. Very different. So people will walk around and, you know, get all teary-eyed over, uh, Buck Rogers. Uh, they'll get, they'll, they'll weep over, uh, over Dumb Dora comic strips. But they, <laughs> what actually went on during the period, historically, they have no, you know, no, it's, what do you mean? Uh, you know. Now, the reason I brought this out, uh, you know, I, I was reminded of that today. Is, uh, I was, I was looking at the Times, uh, this, uh, it, which by the way, I don't, uh, I'll have to give my own personal feeling about this, the New York Times. To me, I feel, and this is personal, there's a lot of things I, I, you know, reading the Times is like a great compendium of, of, uh, of folly, uh, chicanery, uh, hopes, dreams, you name it. It's all there. It's like every day's newspaper is an immense play. And it's a play of, uh, of, uh, whoa, I, I can only say continuing ramifications. It just goes on. It's like, it's like being hooked into some enormous continuing serial, like, uh, like a vast, uh, perverse soap opera. <laughs> it just goes on and on. And, uh, for my own taste, I always feel like, uh, I'm home when I see a copy of the New York Times. Now that's me. It may not be you. You may feel that way about the post or, or about the news, but I, I, it's the times with me. And wherever I am, uh, if I'm, uh, if I'm, uh, say, uh, in some place like, uh, recently I was out in Deadwood, South Dakota. And, uh, this is alien country for, you know, a Sixth Avenue type like me. And I'm out there in Deadwood, South Dakota and I go into this drugstore and they had all these, uh, plastic uh, bowls and stuff you could buy that, uh, that, uh, sprinkle, uh, 
uh, hair lotion out of the horns. Yeah, you got all, all kinds of stuff like that. And they had a hot dog stand there that was in the shape of a uh, of a covered wagon. It was the most grotesque thing you ever saw. It was a, but a terrible looking cover. It was like a covered wagon made out of vinyl, and it was long. See, and they had they had a various types of hot dogs that you could buy there called the the Trail Boss, uh, Wyatt Earp. Uh, the, the Marshal. <laughs> Talk about a sense of history. That's where our sense of history stops. But, uh, I, I wander past this, this terrible looking hot dog joint, and, uh, I'm, I go into this drugstore. I needed some razor blades or something, and here all this stuff was all around me. The Deadwood, uh, well, the, the Deadwood, uh, souvenir world. It's just, uh, it's just overwhelming. And, uh, you walk in, they have, they have things like, uh, like a catcher's mitt. That is in the uh, shape of uh, of a uh, Jesse James face, you know. <laughs> oh, it's incredible stuff, you know. Uh, you think I'm kidding? Listen, they had a they had a lamp there uh, that was made in the form of a hanging tree. Wouldn't you like to have that one? It had a it had a bark a fake bark shade, see, with a brand on it. There was a brand like a, a Deadwood DX Bar Four Ranch, and. Uh, they had little guns hanging, little little plastic guns that were like fringe hanging around the edge of the lamp. It's just an incredible example of, of let's say, dynamic ugliness and bad taste. And the, the, the actual body of the lamp, the stem of the lamp, see, it was a, it was a table lamp. The stem of the lamp was a plastic tree, like a tree branch. It, it looked like a little, like a plastic tree, actually. And it had a plastic branch sticking out from it. And hanging out to the tree was this plastic noose that came down. <laughs> See, Deadwood was known for its, uh, let's say, quick, simple, and very effective, uh, quote, justice. And uh, if the native towns, in fact, they wrote a they wrote a great uh, novel about that, the Oxbow incident. There's a, you know, uh, that took place in that area there. See, so if they didn't like your looks, man, the next thing you know, you're swinging in the breeze, and uh, that's that's. Uh, and so you can get a lamp now that commemorates that uh, that uh, folk ritual, and it's really beautiful. Don, you'd like one of those things, eh? Yes, that's just your style. In fact, Don, you're a dog fancier. Well, they had they had another one I thought was really great too out there. They had a a set of plastic dogs of various uh, uh, thoroughbred breeds: uh, the Weimaraner, the uh, the uh, Doberman, various elegant breeds. And they were made in, they were plastic, see, but they had holes in their head. And, uh, they sprinkled things like, uh, pepper and salt. You can get a Weimar on it or sprinkle the salt on you. And of course, they had one really great dog there that, uh, you press the button and, well, you know what dogs do when they walk up to a, right? Well, uh, <laughs> that was a gravy boat, by the way, friends. So would you give a bad, a bad taste a cheer? Give me a little cheer in there, please. The cheer. If you will. That's it. That, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bad taste. Bad taste is the mustard sauce of existence. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. That was nice. Did you like that? Well, uh, anyway, I was looking at the times. <laughs> well, before we do the times, let's do a couple of commercials here. Do you have, uh, let's see, uh, do you have that, uh, cruise commercial? How about that one, huh? All right, hit the button. It's dining in the grand manner. It's dancing the night away. Thank you, thank you. Oh, you're a great audience. It's great entertainment. It's an enchanting Caribbean island. It's a Holland America cruise to the West Indies. 10 or 11 days on the beautiful S.S. Veen Dam to five of the most fascinating ports in the Caribbean. Sailings, April through November, from just $595. And no fuel surcharges or price increases after you book. Holland America to the West Indies. It's the possible dream. See your travel agent or call 212-760-3880. That's 212-760-3880. The S.S. Veen Dam is registered in the Netherlands Antilles. We're sure, we're sure, we're sure, at Shopwell. We're sure about 
don't know what to do. You don't mind if I join in with the crowd here. I'm so high. Oh, sure. 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 We're sure about our farm fresh dairy. Dairy. We're sure about our friendly service. Service. Sure Let's shop well, let's shop well. Chock full of nuts coffee. One pound can, 99 cents. Let's shop well, let's shop well, let's shop well. Gee, I'm singing great. You know, I do this to you know, clean out the sinuses, get things moving here. Uh, chop well, chop well. Let's see now. Uh, let's get a couple of these others out of the way here before we launch into tonight's uh, sermon. Uh, which high potency... <laughs> We're talking about vitamins. Don't get excited, man. Which high-potency vitamins do physicians and pharmacists recommend the most? Well, it's Theragran and Theragran M. Why, you just walk down the street any day, and you'll see doctors all standing around, radiologists and all these guys, and they'll be hollering Theragran at you. So uh, why don't you just go and do it? Uh, they're by Squib. The name Squib on the label means you have no doubt about the honor or integrity of the maker. That's Mr. Squib. And right now, you can take advantage of a great special offer. You can buy 100 Theragran or Theragran M tablets at the regular price, regular price, and you get 30 extra tablets at no extra cost. These are available at all fine neighborhood Genovese drugstore outlets. And uh, while you're at it, will you please write a letter to Joe uh, DiMaggio and tell him it is not particular? He always says, if you're particular about your coffee, it is particular, particular, particular. Uh, Theragran M. This is W-O-R, New York, W-O-R, New York. And I'll bet not one of you know what W-O-R stands for. <laughs> to quote uh, Sidney Greenstreet. Uh, are you interested in vitamins containing natural source ingredients as opposed to those unnatural source ingredients? Here's a broad line of squib vitamins containing these natural source ingredients, and they're called Golden Bounty. Golden Bounty, as in Captain Bly, now available in your area. The name squib is important when you buy vitamins, because you want a name you can trust, right? I mean, you know, you, know, you, you really want a name that you can stand there, and you can trust squib. They have all these beautiful natural source ingredients, cod liver oil. That's all. That's very good. A little cod liver oil before breakfast, and wow. Uh, germ oil, wheat germ. Where? Yeah, you'll like that. And brewer's yeast. That's all in these great vitamins. They're golden bounty vitamins, so drop by and see what they're like. Check your Squib Vitamin headquarters at your local pharmacy or department store drug section. No name here on this one, huh? All right, yeah. yeah there it is. Da 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 da. Uh, da, da, ding, ding, ding. You'd like to have one of those hanging lamps, huh? A little salute to lynching, right? Well, uh, you could also, uh, I was in Paris. Oh, wait a minute. We're not the only ones that have bad taste, friends. I was in Paris a couple of years ago, and, uh, among several times I've been there, but this particular time, this thing, particular time, this thing hit me, excuse me, Joe. I'm, uh, I'm walking, I'm walking through this, uh, this store. <laughs> now this was not this was not a, a tourist store. It was a it was a French uh, department store where you know a lot of Frenchmen were walking around looking mad as they so often do. And and uh, I was going up and down on the escalator, and I uh, came to this uh, section where they had a lot of books for sale. I don't know that that crowd they are, they keep writing in French, you know. And uh, they had all these these books, and I was looking at the books, and among other things, they had uh, it looked like a table of uh, I don't know what you could call it. Uh, Auger d'art, I suppose. And I thought it was kind of elegant. I bought one, actually, because I just couldn't miss this. You can get a, a little plastic French guillotine. It's kind of nice. Uh, it's a, you know, a salute to French history. And uh, <laughs> it's a little guillotine there. And uh, you press the button, and what it does is snips off the end of your cigar. 
It has a little basket, and the end of the cigar falls into the basket. You know, bam, just like, uh, you know, A Tale of Two Cities, all those great things. And I thought that was kind of nice. You can also get a little plastic tumbril. You know what is it, a tumbril? You don't know what a tumbril is? Well, the tumbril is the thing they brought the victims to the guillotine in. Aha, the rolling of the tumbrils. It's a kind of cart, a little cart, see. And, uh, and I suppose if I looked long enough, I could have gotten myself a little plastic Madame Lafarge. Uh, sitting there knitting away, see, and uh, <laughs> I salute to French history. Hello there, French history. How are you? Well, uh, speaking of history and getting back to the times, you thought I had lost that one, didn't you? No, no, no. Nope, the thread and the skein of the infinite variety of man's thoughts. But uh, I, I was looking at the times today, and way down at the bottom of the obit page, an interesting little note. Uh, it's, it's the name of a man who died, and he was like 85 or 90, something like that. But what was fascinating, he was the last surviving direct linear, in fact, he was the grandson of Jefferson Davis. You know, you know, you know, you know who Jefferson Davis was, the grandson of Jefferson Davis. Now, to those of you New Yorkers who don't give a damn about any of that, Jefferson Davis happens to have been the president of the Confederacy, part of our great American history. It certainly was fantastic history. And uh, here he was, you know, he was living out in Denver or someplace like that, and he was his grandpa, you know, <laughs> it was Jefferson Davis. And he must have spent some time with the old gentleman, you know. And uh, that, that to me is fascinating. Now, why does it fascinate me? And I heard nothing, I heard nothing on the news or anything about that. The passing of a, of a whole era. Well, maybe, maybe I suppose you have to live in, when you live in a big city, there's really not much sense of history. A big city, you know, there's a sense of passage of time, but not real history. I think the so-called nostalgic fra craze that's going out today is essentially a big city thing. That's my personal feeling. In other words, most people, the only history they've got uh, of a guy living, say, in New York or in the center part of Chicago or in Los Angeles it's his own personal history when he watched uh, Howdy Doody. That's that's all he's interested in. So that's that's called history. Well, uh, you know, speaking of the Civil War, if I may, if I may, you know, deal a little bit with the history. One time, I I talked to a woman. Uh, I just had that chance. I was living out in Cincinnati at the time, going to school and everything there, and and uh, I went on a weekend with a friend of mine who lived uh, in a very small town uh, in, in southern Indiana. Now, this was a very small town, a little tiny town that was so small that it isn't even on most maps. And it uh, just, just a little town. You'd have to get a county map, really, to see this town. There maybe were, oh, 250 residents, something like that. And they lived there forever. These people were way off the mainstream. They weren't anywhere near... Uh, what could be called a major uh, cross-country highway or anything like that. And their life was very much like it had been, well, actually, a uh, hundred years before. And there are a lot of towns in New York State, in Jersey, and in Connecticut that are still like that. Don't think for a minute that I'm talking about anything that's uh, that's past. It's there. There's, there's great pockets of in this country where time simply has not occurred. And for some reason or other, people seem to live to ancient, ancient ages in those places, really old. <laughs> I mean, they just, they sit on the front porch and they rock, you know, with the snowball bushes. And once in a while, a car goes by and they talk about that for hours, you know, that car that went by. And uh, this, this is a big deal. So I was talking to this old lady who at that time was well in her 90s. And she, yes, yeah, she was, she was uh, 92 or 93 but very sharp and uh, very much with it. And nobody ever talked to her about any of this stuff, though. See, they, she, people t tend to not talk to old people about things that they remember, and so they just keep it to themselves. And uh, But I guess because of uh, a perversity in my own mind, uh, yeah, it has to be, because this guy had, this was his aunt, actually his great aunt, and he'd never talked to her about this kind of stuff. He was astounded when she started to talk about it. 
And I, we're sitting in the in the living room there, and the living room was right out of Grant Wood. Uh, you know, the classic American Gothic. There was an old uh, upright piano there, and she had uh, doilies, this overstuffed old furniture, which today would be priceless on the collector's market. And <laughs> she she's sitting there rocking back and forth. And the, the rocking chair alone that she was on was probably worth, uh, today would be probably worth five bills on the collector's market because it had belonged to her grandmother. So you can imagine how old it was. So she's sitting there. And I sat down. She, she was just a, the only, the only way you could tell she was really getting on was that she, she was, she was just a slight bit hard of hearing. But that's really about all. She didn't wear glasses. She was very, Tiny. She weighed, uh, must have weighed about, uh, oh, 85, 90 pounds. She was about four feet ten. A little itsy thing, you know. And, uh, she's rocking back and forth. She's got this white hair. So I said, to her, Aunt Mary! And she said, yes. I said, Aunt Mary? Yes. I said, Aunt Mary, do you mind if I ask you some questions, huh? Hey, what about? There's nobody ever, you know, old people never get asked anything except, uh, do you feel all right? Uh, is your arm okay? Uh, do you want anything to eat? You know, that kind of stuff, see? So I said, Aunt Mary? Yes? Uh, do you remember the Civil War? She stopped rocking. <laughs> nobody asked her this, you know. And she says, of course. I said, where were you living at that time? Right here, of course. I said, well, Aunt Mary, how old were you then? Well, I was a little girl, of course, but uh, I remember it very well. I said, well, what do you remember about it? She said, well, I, I remember the boys marching right past, right out there past the yard. They went right on down the road, and they were they were going to, I believe it was Virginia. Yes, it was Virginia. There was a place there called, uh, I believe they went to a thing called the uh, Battle of the Potomac. I believe they later called it in the newspapers. I said, well, you mean you saw a march pass here on their way to the Battle of the Potomac? Yes, indeed. I remember, in fact, uh, we had a neighbor who lived over in the old Runstead house at that time. Uh, it was, uh, what was his name? Yes, Clarence, of course, yes. Clarence Johnson. Uh, Clarence was the officer in charge at that time. And I remember Clarence walked past the house, and he had this beautiful uniform on, and he waved at my mother, uh, Sophie, her name was, uh, you might remember her, and she's talking to my friend. My friend doesn't remember anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She said, well, uh, he, he waved uh, to, to my mother, and, and I was out on the porch, and, uh, and they, went, they, they just went around. In fact, they were heading towards the railroad station, you know. They had a station down here at that time just past the church. I said, you mean you, they, they left by train, is that right? Yes, indeed. And uh, she said, I'll never forget uh, how later on when... Uh, the war was over. They started to come back. And, you know, uh, the, the, the officers, none of them came back, actually. There were only a very few who came back, you know, because that was the 7th Indiana Rifles. And, and uh, if you don't know anything about that group, but uh, they, they had a bad time at that time. And I remember all of us standing out on the street when they came home, and they certainly looked different from when they went. Oh, I said, my God, she actually saw it, you know. <laughs> And, and, uh, yes, yes, indeed. You know, she said, you know that barn that's over there back at the A&P now? You know what we did there? Well, we, we had a saddle factory there. You know, and, and, uh, my, uh, my brother, who was a little older at that time, you remember Harold, don't you? Of course, my friend, uh, 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 well, uh, Harold worked in the saddle factory. He was too young to go in the army, but he worked down there, and they made saddles for the cavalry there. Uh, holy smokes. <laughs> yeah. And so she starts to tell me these stories. And, uh, and of course, this is down in southern Indiana, way down in the south part of the state. And uh, right across the river, within almost a, a rifle shot, uh, was the, the Kentucky Hills. Now, Kentucky had a very curious history during the Civil War. They were what could, what could well, so in the Indiana in some ways. These were classical border states, particularly Kentucky. Kentucky was right in between. So half of the crowd went to fight for the Confederacy. The other half fought for uh, the Northern armies. And it was really Hasselsville there in all that area. And, and 
what what I then later did it was kind of interesting. I took uh, this little theater there in town, and there was a movie that that had come out. And when this movie was out, it was about exactly that thing. In fact, it was about that area. It was it was uh, Anthony Perkins. Do you know the movie? Well, do you know a movie called Friendly Persuasion? Okay. That was a, yes, that was about that whole area of the country. That was the Indiana, Kentucky hills in that area there where, where you had, uh, you had people who were for the war and people who were not uh, for the war and it was a kind of a, it was a kind of a long blown half, we'll see. So I said to her, I said, uh, Aunt Mary? She says, yes. I said, Aunt Mary, did you see that movie, Friendly Persuasion, with Anthony Perkins in it? <laughs> I certainly did. I said, well, what did you think of it? It wasn't that way, you know, at all. It was fantastic. Here I was talking to a lady who not only had seen the Civil War, she actually remembered it. Then I, I said, well, I'm going to unload on her. You know, very few people ever talk to old people in this country. They really don't. So we, we prefer to, to get Paul Newman's version of the Civil War, see? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah we, we really think that that's the real version, see? Nobody talks to old cowboys. They prefer to get it from John Wayne. So, I, you know, that's, that's the real West. So I said to her, I said, Aunt Mary, uh, can I ask you another question? She said, yes, of course. She was amazed that I was talking to her. I remember she was about 92. And uh, I said, uh, Aunt Mary... Uh, who was the oldest man that you remember when you were young here, when you were living in this town? Do you remember any very old men? Oh, yes, of course. She says, there was, uh, let me see, the oldest man I remember was Yellow Eye Johnson. Yellow Eye, I'll never forget Yellow Eye walking down the road right out there in front of the house. And, uh, my Aunt Rita used to stand on the porch and say, there goes Yeller Eye Johnson, drink is killing him. Drink is killing him, the Bible will wreak a harvest on that man, he's a drunkard. I said, well, how old did he live to be? She said, well, he was 98 at the time. Well, so, uh, you know, the bourbon was doing pretty good with his liver, so old Yeller Eye walking by, and I said, well, what about Yeller Eye? What do you remember about him? She said, well, I remember Yeller Eye... The thing that I remember most about Yeller Eye, he was the last surviving Revolutionary War veteran in town. My God. Here is a lady who actually remembered talking to and seeing a, a, a veteran of the Revolutionary War. <laughs> and she didn't think anything about it, you know. And I said, I said, well... Where was Yeller Eye fighting in the Revolution? Yes, I remember that. I, I, he, you see, he came from Massachusetts. He was in the Massachusetts area, and I believe he was in the Massachusetts, what they called the militia at the time. Now, he spent a lot of time, actually, not in the war, you know. He used to leave for six months at a time. They'd come and get him. But that's the way Yeller Eye was. And, uh, I, oh, I said, did you ever talk to him about the Revolutionary War? You know, yeah, very hard to get through to her, see. Oh, yes, of course, he used to... We had a general store down there where the A&P is now, and he used to sit down there and drink, and that's all he ever talked about was the time that he saw Mr. Washington. And nobody listened to him. <laughs> the guy that saw Mr. Washington. Well, let me tell you, the other day, talk about history. History is disappearing at all, uh, at all points, and nobody is doing anything about it. And, you know, in other words, stopping the, the plugging the holes. So uh, I happen to be at a, uh, in fact, it was the Overseas Press Club, uh, which is a outfit that I occasionally, uh, I'm a member, you know, and I go there once in a while. But there was an old, old guy sitting there with another another guy, and he had a heavy accent. And I sat there, and I knew the, I knew the friend it is, and I, I, I was uh, interested in this old guy because I'd heard uh, some stories about this guy that uh, he had come from Germany, see, and, and more than that, he, he was an old man. He was like possibly 85, maybe going on 90. So I said to him, I, minute, minute I sat down, I said, uh, Hans, and he said, yes. I said, Hans, did you ever see Hitler? Well, of course I saw Hitler. He said, let me tell you how Hitler, one day I'm in this cafe in Berlin, 
And Hitler comes in. At that time, you know, he was considered just a, what we would call today a hippie, right? You, you know of these hippies? Well, he was a hippie. He comes in and he sits down at the next table and the waiter comes over and says, will you please leave? We do not allow you to come in here without a tie. And they threw Hitler out. He was with a bunch of guys. <laughs> well, now there's history, Dad. You just don't think of Hitler as a hippie, do you? Well, in, in, in the, in the Germany of the, of the 1918-1919 period, he was plain ordinary walking around hippie. So, it's very, another thing about Hitler, I remember after that, he come here all the time. I was working for a magazine at the time. Of course, the reason he was there is that he had been the editor of a great satirical German magazine during the 20s, the so-called Weimar Republic. And uh, he's in all the history books. If you follow uh, the history of the Bauhaus and all that, this guy was right there. He was he knew them all, Walter Gropius and the whole crowd. So here he was editing this this magazine, which was a great satirical magazine. Right on top of it, you know, they, because everybody who does these things thinks they're on top of it. You know, this is, the Village Voice thinks it's really on top of it, you know. And uh, New York Magazine thinks it's really tapping what's happening. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth, actually, because when you get further into history, you realize that the stuff that went on at any given time is never reported in the journals of the time. Are you aware that Mark Twain's novels were never reviewed by the New York Times? If you go back to the day that Tom Sawyer came out, no mention. But they got a lot of other bad novels that disappeared quickly, you know. So, so it's very hard to tell. Now, that's, that doesn't mean that people were dumb at the time. That means that the, that the atmosphere was not right to mention it or notice it. He just wasn't part of the, the thing that was going on at the time. Usually he's the, you know, the, the, the real earth shakers are the guys that are hardly ever noticed. So I said to him about, I said, well, did you, when, when Hitler, uh, uh, started to come around like that, Hans. Uh, what did what did your magazine? He says, well, that is is what I was to get to our cross. He says, you know, we never mentioned Hitler. We didn't think he was anything. He come around there all the time with his hippie crowd, and they sit around and they, well, you know what they used to do? They come in without shoes sometimes. They sit and smoke and they they uh, put the cigarette ashes in the sugar in the sugar balls. And they as hippies, they walk around and making all this trouble, and nobody writes about them. They're a bunch of kooks, you know. I said, you mean your great satirical journal was satirizing everything else but what was really happening? But that is the truth. Okay. And by the way, the guy that I was with, this is the sad thing about it all. The, the, the reporter that I was with was bored by this. Yeah, so long, Pop. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, do you have another little goodie here? Let's lay it on the crowd. Yeah, get, get. Yeah, well, here are some grand lies at Grand Union. Here's a little play on words there this week. A fantastic sale on genuine, fresh American lamb. Choose your favorite cut at reduced prices. Freshly ground beef, round chuck, any size package, 89 cents a pound, plus Mott's apple juice, 40-ounce bottle, 49 cents. It's How much time do we have here? Well, listen, uh, I have just enough time to then to do this. Listen to this now, in connection with that kind of history. And this, uh, you know, it's the history of what actually happened. There were people who were right on the, on the uh, scene, and they're quickly disappearing. Well, I got a letter here a couple of days ago, and I rarely refer to letters on the show, as you know, unless I just, uh, you know, throw in a quote or something like that. But this letter fascinates me because a couple of months ago, I did a show where I talked about when I was a kid reading Raphael Sabatini. He was a writer uh, who wrote things like Captain Blood, you know, just fantastic pirate stories. And I love C.S. Forrester. He was always writing uh, the Hornblower series, uh, Horatio Hornblower. Well, here's the letter. Now, I'm just going to quote right from the top. 
He says, uh, he says, I hope you don't mind my writing so frequently, but there is so little to hear on the air today. I feel that I must have a few words to say about the trend of the populace nowadays. He says, and you're one of the few people in all of entertainment that's talking about what's actually happening. Thank you, man. <laughs> he says, in my last letter, I mentioned how Sabatini and Farrell had driven me to sea. Now, listen to this story. This is a guy that went to sea, and he's an old man. But many young folks are influenced by what goes on today to give up their present lifestyles for something rougher. In, you know, this is a big thing going on. In 19, uh, <laughs> listen to this. In 1906, I signed aboard the four-masted schooner Annie C. Ross, a four-masted schooner as an ordinary seaman. On these old buckets, an OS, an ordinary seaman, was in direct relationship to an AB, as an able-bodied seaman, as a sewer cleaner is to an engineer in the sewer service. <laughs> the ABs were all old Scandinavians, most of them in their mid-60s who could climb aloft day or night as though they were treading the streets of Chatham Square, where they were recruited from. Now, here's a guy that actually sailed on a four-masted schooner. He says, these old-timers had been around Cape Horn in square riggers in the late 80s, all the way up to the uh, late, 19, late uh, 1890s, and were only putting in their time to finally uh, the sailor's snug harbor. Some of them were remarkable patronages of all types, personages, really. Swedenborgians. Did you ever hear of a Swedenborgian? That's a fascinating crowd. Anarchists, Christian scientists, and all the other philosophers of the day. It is my opinion that the average sailing vessel sailor was a more educated individual than we have today in most of our colleges. They had been around and they read incessantly. The length of voyages meant that any reading material was devoured over and over and over again, whatever it was. We left New York light without cargo and arrived off Cape Hatteras, where we anchored for 13 days, waiting for a fair wind, the wind being southwest all that time. We lay way offshore and could watch Hatteras light each night, and the coastwise passenger vessels, which no longer exist, passed us on, on the way, going back and forth on the coast. Well now, he says, uh, he says, breakfast. You want to hear what some of the things they, they, they ate? He says, uh, the old man, you know, with the, with the, the chief, the officer, he says, uh, I remember having curry. They called it curry aboard the ship. He says, a nauseous mixture of spices and meat, which went on day after day, and with the meat actually glowing in the dark. Have you ever seen meat when it starts to decay? It actually glows. It fluoresces. He says, our meat would actually glow in the dark through decomposition. It got to the point, though, we actually enjoyed it. When the fresh, and he says in quotes, when the meat was used up, we went to the salted beef, the pork, and mackerel. Breakfast was fried salt mackerel, served fried and hot, and actually delicious. Then uh, dried cereal, oatmeal, with evaporated milk suitably watered, plenty of hot coffee, strong and black, unless you save some canned milk from your cereal and around the pilot bread to save for the watch. This was a big eight-inch circle of biscuit, which you could munch at during the watch. We had an old fisherman cook from Gloucester who could make an apple pie from dried apples that would bug your eyes out, and the meals he could make from salt pork and salt horse beef were astonishing. Then, uh, by the way, ho salt horse is actually beef. Uh, that, that was a sailor term for it. They call it salt horse. Heavily salted and... Uh, he says, the beef was pickled in barrels, heavily salted, and was the genuine salt beef, not the stuff we get today. I recall having to mop up a barrel of badly preserved beef that had exploded between decks, an area that had only three feet overhead, and how unbelievably nauseous I became. He says, now this kind of sailing had nothing whatsoever to do with Raphael Sabatini. <laughs> the romantic idea. He says, I never met a Lady Arabella or some other lovely broad in all of my sailing days. In fact, the last cargo was 9,500 tons of fish scrap fertilizer, which permeated my clothes for the next four weeks. Years went by, and he says, and then finally came World War II uh, and all the stuff that went on during those times. He says, I've always had the feeling that it stood me in good stead during the New Guinea, Philippines, and Okinawan campaigns in which I was involved as a sailor. Can you imagine this? <laughs> he says, after eating, uh, quote, curry, 
and uh, the salt beef that they served on board those ships. K rations tasted absolutely like a Thanksgiving dinner. But uh, <laughs> he says, the most interesting thing about our time today, here's a guy that's seen a lot of things, you can see. He says, uh, he says we, we have developed a, a tremendous uh, population of what I can only refer to as crybabies, people who complain incessantly over things which really are trivial, and he just drops that. <laughs> it's a fascinating letter. Now, now here's a guy that uh, that, that sailed aboard the, uh, the the kind of ships that you see up in Mystic Seaport. He actually was aboard them. And uh, and you know when you when you see these old movies, if you ever watch old movies, I love to watch the old movies where Errol Flynn and these guys are aboard an old four masted schooner and so on. Uh, two years before the mast. Did you ever see that movie? It's a great movie. Uh, and and down, uh, you don't get the flavor, though, of what it must have been like aboard a ship. Can you imagine uh, going down below a ship, uh, down below, uh, down where the, where the stuff is stored, all the, all the food and, and uh, the cargo is stored? Can you imagine what kind of a, of a fantastic uh, pastiche of smell must have been down there? And, uh, and the, the, the heat that must have been part. Well, not necessarily. A lot of these things must have been, you know, many a ship carried coffee, for example. Uh, you know, they, they carried many, many things, uh, these ships. And, uh, can you imagine what it must have been like to be, to be laying near the equator for 27 days straight, uh, be calm because there was no wind, the temperature, uh, running 115 degrees in the sun. Uh, he, this guy had written me a letter earlier about the time that he was become for 27 days on the equator with a load of salt fish, and uh, he said it was a, <laughs> it was some experience. But uh, the uh, the idea of, of history all around you is uh, to me uh, very very exciting. Uh, I talked to a guy one time uh, who had worked for Henry Ford, the original Henry Ford and was one of only three employees that Henry Ford had. And they were building the first cars that Henry Ford turned out by hand in a garage in Detroit. And he, you know, he, and I, and I asked him, I said, well, George, I said, do you ever look around and, and, uh, and you see this great cloud of uh, exhaust fumes and all this hassling out on Route 46? Do you ever, he said, yes, I do. He said, I sometimes look so through all those years, he says, you know, I have a picture that Henry gave me. And he says, at times I look at that picture of old Henry and I say, what hath Henry wrought? And uh, <laughs> so uh, history is all around you, man. You better start asking people about it before it goes. This is WOR New York. Stay tuned for In Conversation. Mobile Oil Corporation presents In Conversation, a series of discussions meant to enlighten and involve you.